A very warm welcome to all of you this afternoon. Um, this presentation is a webinar which is set between um, Praxis and Zenith Associates, which we'll talk a bit more about at the end of this presentation. George Ariadopoulos, as uh, very well known to all of you, he has over 20 years experience with blue chip consumer goods companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, FIA, and that's across Europe, the Middle East and Africa. Uh, his skill is connecting brands with shoppers and driving sustainable business growth through customer engagement and capability development. He holds a master's in, with distinction uh, in management science from Warwick Business School. And today he will look at examples of innovative stores to better understand the role of the sales channel and store format is expected to change with the new normal. In terms of how you ask questions, there is a chat function which is the third button from the left, which is the speech bubble with lines in it. If you would go to that and click on it, uh, please put in your questions. Most of the questions should be visible to everybody, but some of them will only be visible to me. So I will ask the questions at the end of the, of the presentation. So it's going to be 50 minutes worth of presentation and then about 10 minutes of uh, questions at the end. Over to you, George. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much. And um, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining this webinar. Uh, what I'm planning to talk about over the next 45 to 50 minutes, more or less, is try to give you our viewpoint around some questions that seem to come up again and again in the kinds of conversations we're having with, uh, with uh, FMCG companies. Well, the obvious one, which a lot has been said about, is how has the pandemic changed consumption? And we've heard a lot about that. The key question now, as we're coming out of the lockdown, is how much of the changes, how many of the changes in behavior are going to stick and how many of them are going to be with us in the, in the future? The second area is, and you're going to see quite a few examples of that, through the pandemic, we've seen a significant blaring of the channels. The lines between what is um, a retail store and what is an on-premise location are kind of blaring. The lines between um, pure play, uh, pure play um, retailers and uh, physical retailers are blaring as well. So what is happening there and how does that affect shoppers' behavior and retailers' actions actually towards FMCG producers? Now, the third area I will touch upon is on-premise. And for many of you on the call, on-premise is a critical channel for your business. Coffee shops, restaurants are a big part of your business. They have been significantly affected through the pandemic, especially through the lockdown phase. As we come out of the lockdown, what can we expect? Uh, are we looking at things becoming strong, a strong growth again, or are we kind of having some setbacks there? And finally, what can we as, as, as Zenit, uh, Zenit Associates do to help you in addressing uh, these challenges and looking forward to your business growth, uh, to your business growth journey? Now, the way I'm going to do that, uh, I'm, I'm a big believer in, um, in two, two key inputs for these kinds of, of questions, addressing these kinds of questions. The first one is obviously the shopper and the consumer listening to what they have to say. But the second one, and equally important for me, is actually the retail environment, which is why as soon as I got the opportunity and I could actually leave my home, I went back to do uh, to do market visits, which is one of my favorite activities. And that's what I'm going to use mostly today to look at the blaring of the channels. So rather than keeping it academic and kind of uh, um, in a report style, I'll just try and do it a bit more interactive and looking at what is coming back from from retailers activities, because quite often retailers' activities will be driving uh, the, the, the shopper the shopper behaviours. Now, the first area is all around consumption and shopping habits, how things have changed. I, I, I won't spend time on that. You've all heard so much about it, how ourselves being confined to our houses has led to significant changes in our cooking and consumption habits, which in turn also brought significant changes to how where we actually did our shopping. A lot of that was done from small stores in our areas because we couldn't go away, we couldn't drive or something. And obviously, many solutions and many services were offered to actually make this new experience, which is 
so dull in a way and confined, a bit more interesting. And in order to understand that, we'll also have a look at how the trends uh, around consumer and shopper have changed and what, how, how did they change through the pandemic and what can we expect uh, as, we, as we come out of it. Now, as we start thinking about the, the changes in consumer behavior, as I said, the most important change for, for companies in, uh, in food and beverage, equally well in, in, um, in hygiene products, has been confined livings, has been people spending more time indoors, preparing more meals indoors. It was interesting because through the pandemic, we actually saw significant out of stocks in many supermarkets, in many retail stores, in categories like flour on the one end, you know, cooking from scratch, uh, led to significant uh, out of stocks in categories which normally would not move that fast, but also obviously in categories like um, cleaning products, etc. If we stay at the food side, food and drink side of the category, um, the significant change in the on-premise channel, no availability of uh, of meals away from home, actually led retailers to take to 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 accelerate their offering in the area of ready meals, and that's again in the area of the grocery retail stores, another big change. And of course, a change a trend that has been in the making for quite a few years, that of moving from physical retail to to online availability of groceries. Uh, has actually happened over a few months. I was looking at some statistics which suggested that the the online sales for grocery almost doubled through the pandemic. So the availability of products online, groceries online, almost doubled. It's not so. It's no surprise that the three biggest, uh, the three retailers that that saw the highest growth in uh, in 2020 were actually all pure place, Alibaba, uh, Amazon and JD. And that's one area of, of where we've seen significant changes through the pandemic, uh, the one around physical retail. The second one, where actually it's been even more uh, dramatic in terms of the changes we've seen, is the area of offering solutions rather than products. We saw Getir and Gorillas, two fast delivery services, grow significantly through the last 12 months, to the point where both of them were actually um, uh, were actually awarded the unicorn um, badge, which is the, the badge that a, a startup gets when they reach one billion. So both of them, in less than a few months through the pandemic, actually became worth over one billion uh, dollars in uh, our startups. And uh, they have actually made the whole idea of delivery uh, kind of quite different with immediate delivery, very fast delivery. On the other end, delivery is not only about products from supermarkets. Our living indoors and our cooking more meals indoors has actually led to the dramatic growth of services that have been around for a while, albeit not really growing that fast, the meal delivery solutions. So we had companies like Mindful Chef um, grow significantly to the point where Nestle actually acquired two of these companies, Mindful Chef, Mindful Chef being one of them, to expand their portfolio of products and solutions into an area which is growing dramatically, really, really fast. And for those of you not fully aware, the whole idea behind the, the meal solutions, the delivery of, of meal solutions, is that the consumer gets a subscription and he can get a number of meals through the week. Um, delivered to his home based on the ingredients. So you will get the ingredients and the recipe, which you can then follow to make the meal, to prepare the meal. And that actually makes it much easier for someone to prepare meals which are quite more complicated. Or on the other end, you could actually get ready-made meals that you just need to, to, uh, to heat up. Both of them playing with the idea that, you know what, we used to have three or four meals indoors in a week. Now we have seven, so we need something more than what we can uh, as, 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 as a people deliver and prepare. And finally, obviously, the third area, the critical area where we've seen significant changes through the pandemic has been on premise, has been coffee shops and restaurants. Some of them reacted, uh, well, 
different kind of uh, companies reacted in different ways. So we had examples of some businesses operating dark kitchens, meaning um, uh, shops where you can only where they can only cook. You can't actually visit, so they will only deliver the meals they prepare. On the other hand, we had businesses like uh, Pret a Manger. Pret a Manger is one of the biggest coffee shops in in the UK, who actually partnered with Tesco to deliver their uh, croissants through the Tesco stores. So creating a new revenue stream for their business. And we've also had different examples which are now coming up and I'll come up to that in, in a minute of uh, coffee shops and restaurants actually opening in retail stores. And all all these things are happening um, while the, the key trends behind shopper and consumer behavior, in all honesty, have not dramatically changed. So the key themes of experience, convenience, sustainability, health and value have not gone away. They're all still relevant. What has happened and how the pandemic has changed uh, these trends is how they manifest themselves in, in, the, in the retail environment. So experience went all the way from being just about experience in store to being about experience online. How fast can I arrange a delivery? How fast can I order online? We saw the significant growth of, uh, of companies um, like Ocado, who were ready and already only operating online, they they almost I think doubled or tripled their their um, their value in this in the stock exchange through the pandemic because they were ready to deliver on 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 consumers and shoppers' expectations. If we think about if we talk about sustainability, sustainability has gone beyond being about the environment to actually being about caring about the food that is left over. So Too Good To Go is one of the initiatives that has grown significantly through the pandemic, urging shoppers and retailers alike to make sure no food goes to waste. Health is a pretty obvious one. We've gone all the way from thinking about holistic health, kind of more generic themes around, around health, to maybe going back to the basics in some cases, making sure that, um, that the health conditions and the hygiene conditions in store are, are observed. And that has a direct impact on many of the retailers' profitability, because although we have seen retailers grow significantly, grocery retailers through the pandemic, they did have to make some significant expenses to make sure they can they can serve the shoppers in the new reality. And finally, value. And value is, um, I don't think that value is is going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, we all know about discounters and how they are uh, they have been growing recently. Um, actually, I think that value will still be relevant. And as a matter of fact, uh, even more so for some of the consumers as they come out of the pandemic. Uh, you, you, many of you must have recently uh, read in the news about the expansion of Mir, the Svetofors family uh, big discounter chain, which is now coming to the UK as well. Uh, and they have plans to launch 300 stores. Um, and they have a, an interesting, uh, an interesting kind of motto, which is that we can deliver 30% below what Aldi and Lidl can do in terms of pricing, and uh, we'll do that by holding a um, sell or return strategy with our with our uh, with our suppliers. So definitely, there's more to come. But of course, when we talk about value, we have to realize that. It's not all black and white, so there's definitely people who are going to go after value, but we have to make sure that we we cover all the spectrum of the needs. Now let me move to the more juicy part of this of this presentation and start talking about the way channels and formats are blaring, how the lines are blaring. Well, quite honestly, and I just mentioned that earlier, that uh, the pure play retailers have grown significantly through the pandemic. Well, mind you, they 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 are left with uh, quite a bit of profit. So, uh, and although it was probably in the making for quite a while, it actually fast forwarded their plans to expand even into physical retail. So, Amazon is no longer just an online service; it's also a physical service, even in Europe. It was in the US; it's even in Europe. And of course, if we think about what is the direction that this blaring of the channels is going to take. I see convenience and experience as being the, the biggest, the biggest themes there. And let me go into, first of all, 
examples from the from the store visit I did in Ealing Broadway, the first actually Amazon Fresh uh, Amazon Fresh store in the UK. It was beginning of I think it was mid March. Now, first of all, Amazon Fresh already has five stores. So in less than three months since this store visit, they've opened four more stores in London. All of them in London. What's interesting with uh, with Amazon Fresh? Um, it's probably it was probably the first time in my in my shopping kind of uh, experiences of having to queue more time to get in rather than to get out. The only reason being that people were not used with uh, Amazon's Amazon Fresh uh, way of entering the store, which is just you scan your your Amazon Fresh code, your Amazon code on your mobile phone, and you walk in. So we had many people queuing because they didn't know how to get in. So in theory. You should get in just by scanning a QR code and going to the store. And once you've done your shopping, you just leave. There's nothing to hold you back. You know, you just pick your stuff and you go out doing nothing. Now, the reason why Amazon has been able to do that, which has been kind of a destination for many other retailers, is because actually the, the technology behind it and the amount of cameras they have in place and the amount of uh, clever algorithms they have in place is, is actually quite big. I've tried to trick the machine. I've tried to trick Amazon by picking up and putting down and maybe placing products in different places just to see if I could trick them and get a, a something wrong in my receipt, which is delivered to my Amazon app when I leave the store, but I couldn't. So you just go in, you find whatever you want, you put it in your in your bag and you leave the store. Now, in terms of what does the store really look like? It's a small store, it's a small supermarket. So uh, in essence, you can expect to find all the great things that make many of the UK stores so good about buying uh, a small meal on the go or something like that. So they have an excellent meal deal, a very simple idea of a meal deal. So you get your main meal, which can be a sandwich, which can be uh, a hot meal or something. And if you add a drink and a dessert or a snack to that, you just add one pound. It doesn't matter what is the value of the drink. It doesn't matter what is the value of the snack or the or the yogurt or whatever you're having as an add-on there. It's just very simple and straightforward. You just add one pound to the price of the of the main meal. Now, obviously, that makes shoppers' lives very easy, and uh, and very very straightforward and very uh, fulfilling the whole experience. However, it might pose some challenges if you're on the supplying end of um, you know, supplying the drinks and maybe supplying SKUs which are higher in value. And that's some of the details that might be interesting to, to look into. In terms of the, of the experience, quite interesting to see that you can have obviously coffee on the go in the store and you can see that it, it was very good for me because as you walk past the store, you can actually see the coffee machine. So it's not something like many times, you know, you have the coffee machine uh, or or a coffee making hidden somewhere in a, in, a, in a in a store. In that case, it's very clear. So that as you walk past, you know that you can just walk in, grab a coffee, leave, and do that in a minute. And even offering a branded um, oat milk brand there for your coffee give, gives it a good a good uh, good addition. And of course, they are Amazon, so they want to make sure that they offer. The, another point for collection, so the services end, definitely you can collect your items, you do, you do your, pick, your, pick and your pickups from the store. So if you fast forward that by, I don't know, maybe three or four years, for Amazon, it will be, first of all, an added revenue stream for uh, small through small supermarkets, but it will also be a reduced cost of deliveries because what they're now doing by delivering to central locations or to your home, they can do it when they have enough stores in, in the metropolitan areas, at least, directly from the stores. And of course, um, they didn't stop there. Recently, I think it was probably two weeks ago, Amazon opened their first salon, Amazon Salon in, in London again. And Amazon being who they are, it was not just about offering um, services as a salon. It was also about offering augmented reality that can, uh, you know, you can try different looks without actually having to go through the trouble of, of doing it physically and realizing the color doesn't suit you or something like that. 
And of course, you have all the good things that that the, the, the digital environment allows you to do, which is things like uh, point and learn. You can look at different products, scan them with your phone and already see what it is, what the price is on the Amazon store, and if you want to order it immediately and get it delivered. Now, I well, sorry, I, I do apologize for the pictures. I didn't actually go to the Amazon salon, so sorry about that. My my store visits were limited to um, uh, to grocery retailers, uh, but definitely I I see what has been a trend for so long, like the whole idea behind experience in retail. And many of us have baffled with how you can make it uh, kind of a, a feasible and one that has a, some return on investment. Well, we can see that in some cases, digital companies can actually start to do that even faster than many of the, of the physical retailers who have been struggling with it for quite a while. And that could be an opportunity for you to take back to your customers and to start talking to them about trends which are happening and they are missing out on by being too um, too worried about who pays for what and how do we do in-store theater and who pays for the extra space, et cetera, et cetera. Their competitors, their digital competitors, their online competitors are gonna start doing it uh, and, and get going maybe faster than they do. Now we've talked about Amazon, but all the physical retailers have not actually waited to see what is happening. So they've actually taken pretty good steps through the pandemic to make sure, and even after the pandemic, to make sure they are fit for business. Well, I have an example here of the store, of the Sainsbury store in um, in Ormond House in, in, in London. And it was one of the pilots that they did about a year ago or so, uh, which was a store built around the whole idea of fast shopping, of going in, uh, getting something on the go or getting a meal. You know, already you can see the idea of incorporating branded restaurants or coffee shops in a, in, in a small store. That's a very quite small supermarket. And that played pretty well for them because guess what? With uh, many of the on-premise locations closed, that store could be a destination for people stranded at home who wanted a quick solutions around a quick solution on a, on a, on a meal that someone else will cook for them rather than them themselves having to do it. Even more importantly, and that, that was one of the trends we saw through the pandemic, they actually utilized their closed central locations, Sainsbury's did, to use Chop Chop, which was their delivery service, uh, deliveries on bicycles, actually sourcing the products from the closed stores and making an additional, you know, making delivering value through a location that would otherwise would not be able to deliver any, any sales. Waitrose, uh, for those of you aware of the UK market, kind of a, a very good environment for dining solutions, for food for tonight, for, for kind of meals for tonight, etc. And Morrison's an interesting one. And once again, the lines are blaring because Morrison's recently, I think it was about a month ago, launched their own um, uh, Morrison's also their own catering offering. So now you can cater for your party, for your event through Morrison's. Thus going into other areas, other other businesses and expanding their footprint in, in more occasions. And as I said earlier, it was interesting. I was reading uh, as the CEO interview, I think it was a week ago, he actually said, we want to make the hypermarket a destination again. And it kind of really, it sounded very strange to me because we've all been talking about how the hypers have been declining quite significantly, especially in the in Western Europe over the past five to 10 years. They have been in, in, in a continuous decline because people want quicker shopper exp shopping, shopping experiences. They want more local uh, places to shop and more convenience. Well, actually, the pandemic, one of the results of the pandemic might be that we could see the hypers taking a new uh, role as, as, we, as we come out. And it's, no, uh, it's not by accident that we, we actually saw Greg's opening uh, coffee shop locations in Asda and Sensbury is making a partnership with Carluccio's uh, kind of a restaurant who are opening their their uh, their restaurants in Sainsbury's. I've talked a lot about the UK uh, retailers, which is where uh, with all the confinements of traveling, my, my market visits have been easier. 
but I did. I do have examples from a couple of uh, French retailers, uh, albeit before the pandemic, but still many of the trends hold. So Carrefour in Paris, they, they had launched quite a while ago the Bon App uh, store format, which is all about central locations, walk in, walk out pretty fast, grab a meal during your lunch break or something like that. And then the store in Milan, Urban Life, which is really, really a, a great store in case you are in Milan, try and visit it because the lower floor is like a small supermarket. And then on the top floor, you have a very convenient, very nice, very pleasant area where you can sit and enjoy a cup of coffee or, or, or a quick meal, a quick bite. And finally, Casino. Casino, I visited one of their stores in, in, in Paris, uh, again, about a year ago before the pandemic. A very interesting concept store with a with a walking in from the street level and a store that looks a bit like a high end coffee shop with very exclusive chocolate bars and very good quality coffee you can enjoy and some exceptional choices of uh, of snacks, etc, which is the main area of the shop. And if, by the way, you need to buy something like, you know, some items for your for your home, you walk downstairs and you go into a basic a supermarket offering a basic range of necessities. So be it on your way out of work, you know, having a meal or a, or a drink with friends, and then you just grab a couple of items and, and, and off you go. Again, blaring the lines between what is having a meal or a coffee uh, in an on-premise location, or actually making sure that I, I, I meet the needs for my grocery shopping. Now, and I hope this has been inspiring and interesting for you. One of the topics uh, which is a bit more, well, it's definitely a question mark for all of you on the call, for all of you actually working with coffee shops, restaurants, etc., is what will happen with on-premise. Um, to be honest, no one can really tell what will happen with on-premise. What we can do is we can think about alternative scenarios and identify the parameters that seem to affect them so that you are prepared and we are prepared for different scenarios. The reason why we really can't tell what will happen with food service is, first of all, that we don't know what will happen with COVID. So even though we all are optimistic about the return to normality, in reality, uh, what we've seen, especially recently in the UK and some other countries, is that it, it's not that simple. It might take a bit longer. And of course, it's also important to realize that people will come out of COVID slightly different to what they were before, and they might have increased expectations of the, of the restaurants and the coffee shops they walk in. One thing I can tell you for sure, and I haven't found anyone who disagrees, is that given the opportunity, people will rush outdoors again and they will go and try and enjoy a meal or a coffee or a drink outdoors. The recent openings of pubs in the UK, and I can definitely talk about that, and restaurants has actually shown that. Some places uh, one would have to try to book two to three weeks in advance to get to get seating. So definitely, especially during the summer where the, the weather is, is, is uh, quite good, um, we are we are seeing that happening very very quickly. Now, instead of talking about all the different types of stores when it comes to on premise, and obviously on premise is a is a wonderful channel, but still it's a very very complicated one because you have so many different types of 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 uh, of, um, of companies of of different restaurants, coffee shops. The trends can be different if you're talking about. QSRs or if you're talking about full service restaurants, so it's quite difficult to generalize. I did, however, visit Italy um, a month ago or so, a few weeks ago. For those of you who don't know it, Italy is a, a chain of um, grocery slash restaurant slash experiential stores, which originated in Italy uh, with the aim of expanding and, and showcasing uh, Italian food and drinks throughout the world. As it stands now, they have uh, 30, 80, if I'm not mistaken, locations uh, throughout 12 or 13 countries. 
It's interesting, and uh, Serkan definitely will will understand what I mean, uh, being from from Turkey, because the the founder said that his inspiration for for developing Italy was actually the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, and when you walk through an Italy store, and they recently I, they they opened the the London store a month ago, and when you walk in, it's like a, there's a plethora of different images of different smells of different sounds of different uh, experiences coming to you so they will offer things like normal products you can buy off the shelf all the time with a focus on italian cuisine uh, but they will also have locations like they have three restaurants in their um, in their london in their london uh, location where you can sit down and enjoy your meal but even more importantly they will have the place where they actually make the mozzarella cheese, where they make fresh pasta, and you can either buy it and take it home, or you can sit and enjoy it in one of the restaurants. And finally, they will even host, and they just started doing that as we came out of the of the lockdown, they will even host um, experiences where you can learn how to cook Italian food, or where they will open their mozzarella making uh, station, and they will teach you how to make mozzarella cheese or how to make fresh pasta. So it's a, overall a very, very full experience. Now, um, as you as you can see, if you do go, and I do urge you, I mean, there, there are locations, quite a few in the US, obviously many in Italy, and there are a few in, in the rest of Europe. Uh, if you do get a chance, do go in these stores just to, just to immerse yourself in, in the experience. It's a very interesting uh, store and a very experiential one. Now, one would see if they walk through Italy, that there's a lot of focus on um, the charcuterie or the fresh cheeses and stuff like that, which will be cut exactly as you like and you'll get exactly the piece you like and everything. You have bread being made on location and you do have the restaurants where you can enjoy everything. Now, this sounds like if you're, if you're operating in a company, if you're working in a company which is not Italian, well, you might say, well, so what? I mean, there's very little chances of my products being sold in Italy. And I, I do see your point. However, you have to realize that this trend is relevant for all of the different uh, kind of on-premise locations. If you're working with a, with a, with a, with a chain or with a, with a coffee shop or with a restaurant who, can, who is open to the opportunity of using your brands and your products to actually make their experience a bit more immersive, that's where you should jump at. That's where you could actually create that extra link with your with your customers, which will set you apart. And even though we're talking about Italy and we're talking a lot about, you know, like the, the, the Parmesan cheese and stuff like that, they do actually have branded products. And the branded products that are in there are showcasing their expertise by connecting themselves to beautiful experiences. So Aperol, uh, Aperol, Aperol is not about selling bottles of Aperol in the supermarket so much. It's more about um, uh, offering an experience of a perfect serve of an Aperol spritz in the restaurant, which is actually, uh, you know, the, the whole environment. You can see logos of Aperol and you can actually enjoy your drink made in the perfect way in the, in the, in the La Terrazza restaurant. In the same way, the Italian chocolate Venci is not about just buying chocolate. I mean, you can buy chocolate if you want, but what they've actually done is they've made a very impressive display on uh, about, I think it's maybe five meters wall in the coffee shop. So it's not necessarily about you buying the chocolate. You might buy the chocolate, it's there, but it's about showcasing how Venti is a, is a big accompaniment. Venti chocolate is a big accompaniment to your coffee, to your espresso, or your cappuccino. And of course, the number one selling product in Italy, no surprise, is a brand of, of pasta. Eh? No, no surprises there. Um, and with that, and having been inspired by the kind of different experiences that you can find in Italy, uh, the store in London, and again, I do urge you to go and visit them if you get a chance. The one in Istanbul is fantastic, by the way. It's probably the one I enjoyed most than any, more than anything else. Let's start thinking about what is expected to impact our businesses as we come out of the pandemic? Uh, what will the new normal look like and, and, and how can we prepare for that? 
first of all, I think there are two very important parameters to have in mind and to prepare for as far as you can, as much as you can. One of them being COVID. As I said earlier, we're all very optimistic about how things will go. Uh, vaccination is going very well all over the world, but still there might be some, some, um, some problems in the future. The second one, and probably a critical one, is how many of the people will keep working from home? Now, this is a question I, because this obviously has dramatic effects eh, on, on consumption, for food, for beverages, for hygiene products, for everything. Uh, th there are different opinions in, in, in that topic. Um, some people say, oh yes, companies will never go back to having people in the office because, you know, why not if they can do it by um, keeping people working from home, they're actually saving money on office space and this and that. And that's definitely true, no question about it. However, the kind of the, the the discussions I'm having with people working in different companies, and let's not forget now that we're not we're only talking about office workers in the private sector. Eh? I'll come back to that in a minute. But even for people working within uh, within companies as, uh, in in offices, um, it seems as if if you do have a local presence, if your company is actually operating within your country, and it's not kind of a head office function or something like that, people would still like to create that kind of team attitude and to, to share their, 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 their experiences by being physically in the same space. And even more importantly, let's not forget that this is only the office workers. If you think about big parts of the, of the, um, of the working people, where do they work? You have a very big proportion of people working in healthcare who are actually going to their jobs already, have, have, not, have never stopped doing it. You have people in education, a lot of people in education, who are going back into their into schools, etc. You have a lot of people in retail. As retail reopens and as the on-premise locations reopen, and they, they have already done in many cases, all these people will go back to work. So I dare say that working from home might be a reality, even post-pandemic, even after everything has settled, but it won't be a reality for that big a proportion of the people. And quite often it, we tend to judge from our own companies but let's not forget, we are not necessarily, the companies you work on are not necessarily, um, uh, the, the, the office work that we do is not necessarily what most people will be doing. But more importantly, and the, the critical parameter, which I can't stress enough, is that the pandemic has really created a bifurcation in the, in the people. Uh, on the one end, we have people who have not lost their jobs, who have kept working through the pandemic, but could not spend anything. They could not travel. They could not make, you know, eat meals out, etc. So most probably they came out of the pandemic after a year of lockdowns um, with more money in their bank accounts than they would have done otherwise. Now, these people are the ones who are going to look for the uh, full experiences, who are going to start spending money on expensive restaurants, who are going to start traveling and spending money in in uh, in meals out of home etc but on the other end of the spectrum we will have the the, the people who have been significantly um, impacted uh, by the pandemic in, in in some cases they have lost their job they they can't make ends meet anymore because of the challenges they face through the pandemic and these are the people who are going to be looking for more value for money solutions uh, as they go into into buying uh, groceries or even going into restaurants. So what does that mean for us? Uh, that means that regardless of the business you're in, you need to kind of really understand your portfolio very well, understand what where your products stand, who are your target shoppers, and what, how are their, their needs and their capabilities changing through the pandemic? Is your category a category that is... Um, you know, high value that might risk uh, being replaced by by own brand or by retailer own brands or stuff like that. Do you have an offering that will meet the needs of the the part of the population who's looking for more exceptional, more experiential products? How does your portfolio stand to meet the needs of these two changing um, uh, to, to changing uh, parts of the population? You might not have for both of them, but if you do have for one of them, make sure that it actually resonates with them in the new reality. Uh, 
And finally, how we can help. And that's my that's my last slide. And then I will pass it on to Michael to talk a bit more about Zenith. But the way I see it, if you think about your your chance to create a channel strategy that will get you through the, 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 the post pandemic era with the increased sales, there's three areas we can we can really help. The first one is on the analytics and the analytics actually work on two levels. It's on one level, it's about understanding the drivers of change. So if you think about, if we take it back to the example of on-premise locations, uh, the two important things about on-premise is opportunity and affordability. So through the last year, opportunity was not there. The store, the, the restaurants and the coffee shops were closed, so no opportunity for people to shop. As we come out of the pandemic, there will be more opportunity for people to shop in the, to actually spend money in restaurants and coffee shops because they will be reopening. However, affordability may be a question for some of them. So the have nots may not find it as easy to spend money on, on, on meals out of home. How do we prepare for that? Well, there are clear indicators for affordability that we can measure and, and, uh, and monitor so that we are ready for the next reality, for the next normal. And these are things like the, the disposable income in your country, which is going to be different in, 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 in country by country, geography by geography, but also the, employ the employability, how many people are actually employed. And this is obviously one part of the analytics. The second part of the analytics, which is an area where um, Zenith as a network can help, is all around not looking for the drivers, but looking for through uh, data mining and artificial intelligence, looking to make sense of the huge amount of data that is available out there. So, for example, if you're operating, um, if you're interested in on-premise, you could look at the, the Google statistics of where people move and start to create a plan for which locations to prioritize as you start thinking about spending more wisely your money in your, in your, in your partners and your customers. Now, the second big topic is insights, obviously, and I've been in insights for for in one way or another yeah, as, a, as a supplier, as an insights provider or as a, as, a, as a user of the research for all of my career. And obviously, there's plenty of techniques and plenty of ways that you can use to mine insights on consumers and shoppers. But one of them, which is which I find very interesting and I've been using more recently is agile qualitative where we're actually looking at a much more cost effective and quick solution to understand the shoppers and consumers reality through their own eyes and get direct feedback from how they experience their reality. And of course, it all comes to life when you start thinking about how do we activate for a, for a channel strategy? How do we activate? How do we make the right shopper value offer and the right go to market strategy to make sure that we can we can deliver for our for our shoppers and consumers? And with that, I will pass it on to Michael to take us through the, 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 the last two slides. Thank you very much. And Michael, I will let you introduce yourself. So let me just go to the next slide. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. We, we will be doing questions at the end. This is a bit of an echo. So I'm sorry there's an echo that you can hear. Um, the, the, I wanted to just really do two slides. One is to show a business cycle. Now, the business cycle is uh, something which we just put together to show the various different points at which companies would like some consulting support. So you can start this anywhere, but I'm going to start this at the, at the beginning, as I see it, which is planning. Uh, Zenith, the consulting company, and Zenith, as many of you will know from uh, the various different events and conferences, but also research and reports allows people to plan so they can unlock opportunities. They also have a system to be able to help develop solutions for those opportunities, which is commercial, water and environment, and manufacturing. Once you have that solution, that will manifest itself as a product, and that could result in a new recipe or new packaging or a new structure. So that first quadrant is something which Zenith has been providing for many years. And going forward from that, the associates build on that by allowing and building consumer demand, which allows you to implement any new ideas and innovation and integrate M&A, to manage your portfolio strategy so that you have competitive advantage, 
to do marketing skills and use sustainable marketing promotional materials. And George has very eruditely spoken about Shopper and the category insights and channel activation. But once you have your consumer demand and you start with the customer supply, then you are talking about a better arrangement with your customers. That will require more negotiation agreements, more joint value creation, and more technical and sustainable delivery as the scale increases. The fourth and final quadrant is engaging stakeholders. So once you've unlocked the opportunity, created the consumer demand, created the customer supply, then you need to be able to report back to your shareholders on the sustainability, on the results, uh, and also changing the way you do report. You will have to report more to the EU and various governments, as we see with new reporting submission structures. There's also greater strategy on the engagement with shareholders from sustainability, with B Corp, green growth strategy, and a whole range of new elements which access more funds. As the organization changes, you need a new organization structure and sometimes new people. So we have consultants for all of those elements too, and leadership coaching. So all this is, if I can have the next slide, George. All this is available on the website, on the Zenith Global website, but we now have very good consultants for each one of those areas. So for every area I've just discussed, we have a consultant. And some of you, I think, will recognize a lot of the players that are already here. And uh, we've got some seriously big hit hard hitters, not just George, but also people from the Consumer Goods Forum, many people from the Coke system, from Unilever, Pepsi, uh, and from the startups, some companies that you'll know from CCEP, but there's a range of faces which you'll recognize. And once you go onto the website, you'll be able to see how it all fits together. And next week, you will also see a little bit of CV about those individual players and the consultants that we have. Okay, so that's Zenith Associates and that's how it works. And I think, George, we're going to go to questions next. From what I see, we have... Let me unmute myself, yes. We have six questions that I've got here. Some of them are on the chat for everybody to see and some of them uh, are not. So I'm going to start with... Uh, yeah. What do you see as the role of planograms in the future and where you still may end up having some form of restrictions on indoor spaces? It's interesting you mentioned that. Actually, I, I, we, I was on a conference a few weeks back and we had a, a lady from Asda and I had been myself made aware of significant changes to allocation of space in categories in store, not surprisingly to um, to take into account the the changes in, in consumer preferences in store. But she was quite adamant that they have done no changes to their allocation in store. What I can say about planograms and about the, the role of the, of the category in store is two things. One is obviously the, the recent uh, changes in terms of promotions for categories which are not um, deemed as healthy, you know, uh, so that's definitely going to gonna affect a lot, the, the kind of the, the, the allocation of space in store for many of the retailers. Now, the role of planograms itself, I think is, there's a divide there. I've been lucky to have worked in different geographies. So if you talk to retailers in, in Western Europe, in most of Western Europe, it is becoming less and less a matter of the supplier the planogram, it's actually becoming more and more a matter of an automated process um, within the retailers' um, teams. And they're actually driving a lot of the change and our role is becoming smaller and smaller. Now, the only opportunity I see for planograms to actually come back into kind of the, be influenced from, from us as, as suppliers is value adding. So it's no longer about doing the the kind of the, the 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 category reviews and stuff like that. They will listen to us, but eventually they will do what their own internal indicators suggest. 
But when it comes to added value services, I think that's where we have a role to play. And of course, just to be fair, the situation in, in other parts of the world, the situation in um, Eastern Europe, for example, or in Africa or the Middle East is totally different. So retailer, sorry, um, manufacturers have a big role to play and we can still make significant changes to the category layout, uh, given that we have a reason why and, 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 and uh, it all makes sense. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. I was just thinking about how fun your presentation was, just because uh, we've all done market visits, but uh, I love the idea of you going to Amazon and testing the system to see if you can break it. That's, luckily, I don't think that's something we've done in other other retailers where we've been on market visits, but uh, I think the role of planograms would be quite interesting if you start trying to rearrange everything. Uh, I'll get through more of the questions. So, second question is: Do you see the do you see the new HFSS rules coming in 2022 as impacting shopper experience in store? And if yes, how do you see it evolving? And what and what we experience currently? You may need to also explain HFSS. Yes, it's all the all the the new regulations coming in place about promotions for products which are not deemed as healthy. So there's going to be limitations in terms of, uh, you know, buy one, get one free for some categories of products. Now, that is a very, very difficult question. I won't try to address it in its totality. I will, however, share um, a bit of the past experience that we've seen. I mean, I can't tell what is going to happen, but I can tell you that in the past, whenever um, authorities tried to regulate um, let's say the shopping experience in store, they did in the end have an effect on, on consumer behavior and on shopper choices. However, in all of these cases, the manufacturers who came out of these difficult situations um, stronger in terms of the relevant position in the market, because, you know, if the whole category is going to go down for whatever reason, uh, Winning may not necessarily be about growing the category, it may be about securing your place and offering added value and services to your customers. So I think that the manufacturers who have managed in the past, looking at lessons from the past, to maintain a good position in a changing environment are the ones who have managed to connect with shoppers across different touch points. So if the, the store is becoming a limited space, the physical store, a limited space for connecting with your shoppers, we'll try to connect with them in different locations. If promotions are no longer that relevant for them, what can you bring in place of promotions to, to still offer uh, more of the experience of, of, of buying and using your, your categories? I think, honestly, for, from past experience, these are going to be the ones who are going to be winning, the ones who can expand their footprint outside the store. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, in the UK Soft Drinks Congress, Asda presented their sustainable outlet, which was very impressive, and Tesco's and Sainsbury's and a few others were in that, in that conference. Do you think other retailers will join that by making a sustainable store? Well, let me tell you, there's one thing I love. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked in commercial for the best part of the last 10 years. One thing I really love about retail is that retailers are very practical people and they're very kind of trial and error. So in all honesty, I think that they will try it. Some of them will do it in different ways than others, whether it will be successful or not. And that's the beautiful thing about retail and about shopping. It's not about the idea. It's not about oh yes, let's all go, go out there and do sustainable packaging. It's about delivering the idea in a way that is sustainable for the business. Now, who will manage to develop a model which can actually work and how many, even more importantly, how many of the manufacturers will go on board and actually co-develop solutions is the big question. And that's one I think for some of the retailers it will work, for some of them I dare say it will not. Okay, thank you. Um, at recent conferences, both Zenith, The Economist, and the UN Global Compact in the last couple of days are all suggesting that carbon tax is inevitable. Which channels will this hurt and which channels will this benefit? Ah, oh, that's an area I really, I really lack the, 
the in-depth knowledge to comment on, to be honest. I think that's probably an area where we do have great um, uh, great consultants within the Zenith network that could actually address that, but I think that I wouldn't be the best one to do it. Okay. Um, with the number of brands getting stronger in the DTC space, how do you see retail brands' relationships evolve? The background is previously brands have uh, been hesitant to sell directly from the website to avoid antagonizing the retailer. You may need to, that's direct to consumer, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. No, this is, this is again, one of the trends which has been in the making, but kind of very, very low in, in, uh, in terms of the take on from, from manufacturers. Um, obviously, the pandemic has, uh, has given rise to many initiatives in that area. I have to say that uh, my personal opinion, and that's just my personal opinion, is that it's very much dependent on the category. So there are categories which lend themselves very well to direct to consumer um, because of their kind of uh, affinity, their kind of ease of actually doing that. There's other categories where I have seen myself um, companies trying to develop models to deliver direct to consumer and have found it that it's not really economical, it's not really, um, it doesn't really work. However, that's the same thing that retailers said uh, two years ago about e -com. So whenever you talk to a physical retailer about selling over the internet, they would all say, oh no, you know, we're doing it, but it doesn't work because uh, there isn't enough shoppers, so we're actually losing money. And all of a sudden, we've gone past that tipping point where there are enough people shopping online to actually make that worth a while. And the retailers who were ready for that were the ones who took advantage of the growth. In the same way, if your category lends itself to direct to consumer, you might want to actually um, invest ahead so that when the time comes, you're ready. And I, for some categories, I think it's very easy for that time to come, especially if you can complement the product with an additional service, which is what makes it more personal and more relevant for your for your shopper and your consumer. Beautiful, thank you very much. Um, well, we've reached the end of our time. There are two more questions. I don't know if you'd like me to just carry on and let people drop off, or um, how would you like to do this, George? Um, I would suggest, in respect of everyone's time, if uh, if if we just keep the questions and we can get back to the person who've asked them. And um, and you know give them give them a quick reply and we can catch up in person if they, if they would like to and in that way we can finish exactly on on the hour and uh, and um, yeah well then it, the hour is up and uh, I'll leave it to you to 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 summarize as you wish thank you so I wouldn't like to summarize all I would like to do is first of all allow everybody's microphones if I can do that over the next couple of minutes. And um, and just say a very big thank you for all of you that uh, that uh, joined us today. I hope it was at least um, inspiring, and you did find something which you had, you had not heard before. You definitely heard many things you've heard before, but that's that's not uh, that's not a big problem for me. But if you've heard if you've heard today something which is interesting and different to what you've heard before, then I'm I'm very happy. And with that, thank you very much. I think you can talk now. I think I've unmuted everyone. So have a good rest of your day and uh, hoping to hear from you soon again. Bye there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir. Bye-bye.